Hi everyone and welcome to week six. We're going to be talking about database documentation this week. So what is documentation? Documentation in general is a way of being able to write down and plan what you want to say and record about what's going on. This should end up including descriptions and notes for anything you're trying to keep a record of. This will generally have some sort of instruction set for what you're doing. And one of the things that's really nice about documentation is it gives you the ability to share what's going on in the current moment with people in the future. So I always like to describe it as documentation is a love letter to your future self. It's a way of being able to say, dear future self, I love you so much, I'm going to write down everything that I'm thinking so that you don't have to remember it, you can reference it later, and you know what was going on. Um, a really good example is for a lot of people trying to remember what you were doing in detail one month ago, six months ago, a year ago, is almost impossible. When you're working on projects, especially if you have a lot of projects, it's really hard to remember what you were thinking. If you were in school a year ago, if you were at a job a year ago, just take a minute and try to remember the exact project that you were working on a year ago without referencing any notes and think about what you were thinking in a project. That's really, really hard to do. Having the documentation and notes is so that you can go back and reference it. You'll see this with programmers. They'll write a lot of readme files and comment their code. You'll see this in databases because we wanna write down all the things that we're thinking about, our plans, our schema, our data dictionaries, our rules, um, and keep it all in version control. You'll see this a lot for uh, systems administrators, network administrators, because they want to write down all of the things that they've done. One of the things that will happen once you get to industry, uh, if you are going to industry, I should say, if you're going to industry, um, is you will sometimes be working on something and weird things will happen or something weird happened in the past and you had to deal with it but because that weird thing happened you had to deal with it in this weird way and so the workaround that you had to find was just kind of odd if you write down what you did for that workaround so that you can remember oh yeah I actually had to go in and do this odd thing because you know the way that I tried it originally didn't work and this system's actually really fragile so I don't want to make these changes um you know that will end up really helping you because if you don't write that down, you're gonna have these weird workarounds. You're gonna have these weird things happening where that somebody else did, decisions that other people made, and you might not know all of the things that went into that decision. And then you end up sitting there and yelling at your computer, asking what stupid son of a monkey did this. And then you'll go back through what you're doing in the code or the script or the database or the system. And then slowly it will come to you that in fact, you, are the stupid son of a monkey that did that and you just didn't remember. And that's why documentation is so important for everybody. Okay, now, um, documentation will also make it easier to share with others. One of the things that can sometimes be overlooked is when you are working on a project, any project, databases included, um, you have to be able to work with others and you have to be able to share what you're doing with others. And a lot of these projects will come back and sometimes they will come back to bite you and what you want to do is have all of these references and rules and everything written down all of these notes so that when you come back to it you'll be like oh well I actually didn't implement this yet because we didn't need it yet the company wasn't big enough but now that the company is big enough this is what my original plan was so now I can go use it it's also a way that everybody can agree what's going on. If you are creating a database and you have this database schema that you've created and you have all of these rules that you've created and you've included all of this business logic, you can do that in sort of a meeting with all of the shareholders and then everybody can say like, you know, oh yeah, this is actually what we want to be doing. This is how we want to be putting it together. This makes total sense. I agree. Let's go. And then having the documentation so that you can refer back to it as you're actually creating that database and say, oh yeah, well we needed to do it this way because of that business logic and we need to do it this way because of that department. That way you don't have to sort of rely on your own memory for that. Um, 
You can also look at the decisions that were made. So if you end up needing to switch projects and then hand over this database to someone and start working on theirs, you have a much better foundation of what's going on when you see that. Another sort of understated way that documentation can be important is for the end user. So they can go back and say, well, how am I supposed to interact with this database? What tables are in here? What information is in here? What questions can I ask of it? What information is being stored? What is the relationship of these tables to each other, if that's relevant? It's also something that you can look back on and say, okay, well, what decisions did I make as I was creating this? Now, when we have documentation, it's not just, um, a lot of times, it's not just like write it, do it, forget about it. It's write it, modify it, update it, things like that. When you are creating a database, you're going to create some design documentation, which is sort of the initial planning phases. You have your data set, you have what you think you want to collect, and then you have to say like, okay, well, I know what I think I want to say. So let's use my example of books that I've been using. So I want to keep track of a database of books. I know enough to know that I want book titles, I want authors, I want publishers, I want genres, and I want, you know, publication dates. So I'm going to include all of that in my schema. I'm going to write up everything I know so that as I'm creating this database, I have all of my notes in place. So I know that I'm going to have you know, first author here, and if there's a second author, maybe I'm going to write a note and say, I'm going to leave it off for now, or I'm going to include it in a note section, or I'm going to have a spot for a second author, or the books that I'm keeping track of don't have second authors, I'm not going to worry about it right now, and I'm going to keep track of all of that. And then as you actually start to collect your data, put your data in, your database actually starts to take shape, this is going to be where the ideal world and the real world crash into each other because all of your idealistic, this is what's going to happen and this is what my data is going to look like and everything's going to fit together so nicely um, will at some point blow up in your face because data does not care about you or me and is going to do what it's going to do. And so once we actually have that, we're going to go and update our documentation. Oh, it turns out, you know, I thought I really knew the books that I was going to be keeping track of and there were no secondary authors. Yeah, no, there was a bunch of secondary authors and now I have to figure out how to update my documentation and update my tables so that I can include the secondary authors. Um, you know, maybe I started this database 50 years ago and the publication date was super important because everybody cared about that. But it turns out now the thing everybody actually really cares about is trigger warnings. And so I want to have that included in here so that I can actually sort based off of that so that I can rec make recommendations to people based off of that because that's the, you know, current trend. And I wouldn't have guessed that I was doing this 50 years ago when I made this database. Documentation should be reviewed on a regular basis to make sure it's still accurate. One of the common things that will happen with documentation is you have this beautiful idea of what's going to happen that will basically blow up in your face when you have actual data put in. And then after you make your changes to your documentation to include some of the, you know, nasty, dirty, real world data that has come in to invade, um, you want to go back and check, is this still accurate? Is this still how I interact with my database? Is this still the plan for how it's going? Does this still match? Are these still the tables I have? Are these still the relationships that they have? Are these still the keys, the primary keys and foreign keys? Is this still how everything is working or did this change over time and now I need to go back and redo my documentation to match that change. So this is going to super wildly depend on the database, but you might end up reviewing your documentation annually. You might end up reviewing your documentation quarterly. You might end up reviewing it monthly. It totally depends on what's relevant. You know, if you do some of your documentation and you make it too keyed into a particular version of something, you might end up having to update your documentation when that updates. So, you know, if you're using a particular version of something and you included a bunch of screenshots, there is an update, it doesn't work anymore, then you end up having to go in and make those changes. Documentation can be done manually. It can also sometimes be automated. Now, 
when we end up having some of our automated documentation, you can actually create schema in an automated way. So you can actually take a finished database and create a schema of that actual database, like how it actually works. And then you can compare it to how you thought it was going to work. And so you can actually see what's going on there. You can also do some updates where you can automatically update some of your documentation, update some of your schema. Some of the documentation has to be done by a human. You know, um, the data dictionary initial set of rules has to be done by a human, but you can go in and say like, you know, hey, for all of my book authors, are these actually strings that follow my what is a name criteria? Um, sometimes we actually use a combination. So maybe we end up having some scripts that are run in an automated fashion on our database, but a human had to go in and document the script so that we knew what the script was doing. So having a script that goes in and does some of these, maybe it's cleanup, maybe it's checks, maybe it's updates, that script also has to be documented to make sure that it's actually doing what it says it's doing and listing what it's doing. That's where the readme is gonna come in. What does the script do? What does it affect? How often is it being automatically run? Is it being run automatically? And if it's not, what are the instructions for how we run it? Those are all the important things that we would need to make a note of. Now, one of the things that you can do is automate whatever you can. So documentation and updating documentation can be really difficult. So if there's a reasonable way to automate something, it's worth doing. But it, you also have to make sure you're checking it. Don't just say, oh, well, I've automated this all away, so everything's going to be great now. Make sure you're actually going back in and doing checks. Did this actually work the way that I think it's gonna work? This is actually a reasonable use case for AI. However, and there is a big however here, we can ask AI to go in and review some of this and give me a structure for, you know, what does it think this script is doing? What does it think this database is doing? What does it think this schema is modeling? And we can ask AI those kinds of questions, but AI isn't always right. AI is sometimes going to give us the wrong answer. It's going to be very confident in the wrong answer. And you have to make sure you're going back in and having some variety of check that the AI was actually correct. The other thing, and this is a big one, is does that AI that you want to use meet privacy and security standards for your database? And in a lot of cases, the answer is no, because if you have sensitive data in your database, you can't just feed it into a random AI. You know, if you have to be HIPAA compliant, if you have to be, if you're in the financial industry and you have to be a particular type of compliant, every tool you use also has to be in compliance. And if it's not, you can actually run into some really big problems. And because AI is relatively new enough, it's not going to meet a lot of these compliance standards. So a lot of this stuff is actually still being done by humans and automation where possible. Now, data dictionaries are where we're going to have descriptions of our data tables and functions. The data dictionary means that you're going to have some variety of consistency across your data, and it should include any conventions required. So a data dictionary should end up having things like, this is the titles of books. This is the author of the book. This is first author only. And this is going to be set up as last name, comma, first name, space, middle name, if applicable that kind of thing because you really want to spell it out like you know for your authors do you have first name last name do you have last name first name do you include middle names do you have this in different records so one record is last name next you know sort of section of the record is first name next section of the record is middle name how are you actually keeping track of all of those things because you don't want to just say oh well I, I can tell the difference between a first name and a last name like no not not really don't make that assumption poor choice so you want to make sure that you have all of these really clear explanations that somebody else can look at a great example of this most industries have their own vocabulary 
while it might make a lot of sense to somebody who's been in that industry for 5, 10, 15 years, whatever, um, it's important that you also have a description of that data so that somebody coming in would be able to tell what that data is. Um, if you don't believe me, go to a school any school and look at all of the different vocabulary that is used. If you are not a teacher, if you have not been in school for a while, for example, what is the difference between an outcome and an objective? If your answer is, well, I don't know. That means that if we had a section in our data dictionary that just says outcomes, objectives, like that wouldn't necessarily be helpful to you, whereas a description might end up helping you a lot more. Business logic is how we can decide what data the business needs, how it's stored, and the types are expected. Business logic is real world constraints. So this means we have to actually pay attention to the business that we are talking about that our database is going to be used in. So let's say, for example, um, we ended up wanting to keep track of a collectible card game. Well, if we wanted to keep track of a collectible card game, we might end up having several things like, you know, the name of the card, the powers on the card, the cost of the card, whatever. The real world constraints or rules will end up including things like which cards can be used with others. So um, like if you play Magic the Gathering, it would explain that if you have a red card and it needs red mana, you can only buy it with red mana. Whereas like otherwise, it might just say red card buy with mana, but if it doesn't specify red mana, it's any mana, that's an actual real world constraint about which mana you can use to buy the card. Uh, if you are not a Magic the Gathering nerd. Um, it's when you end up having rules that that business needs to follow, like class names or class conventions. Like, um, you know, at NECO, it ends up being that there's the first three letters of classes, you know, CIS, CTN, CTE, stuff like that, which will describe the department the class is being offered out of. The three numbers will end up telling you a little bit about the level of the class. And the business logic might end up including, you know, who can actually teach that class or what the prerequisites for that class are. Things like that. Business logic can also include things like what data is considered sensitive. So that could be like student data is considered sensitive, employee data is considered sensitive, financial data, like financial aid data is considered sensitive. It might also include how the database can be communicated with. So like, can we use a dashboard to see our database? Can any end user see the students in the classes? Can any end user see the teachers teaching the class? Can any end user see which students still owe money on the class? Like all of those scenarios and all of that logic is considered business logic. And that's part of what we're talking about when we say, how is the database being accessed? And those are things we need to write down for our database documentation. We would need to be very, very clear that we can see who's teaching the class, but most people should not be able to see who's taking the class. Who's teaching the class is not considered protected. Who's taking the class is considered protected. Um, so like all of those things are really important to write down, keep track of, and make sure that everybody's on the same page for version control. Now, if you've done any programming, you might have seen version control before. It's basically like we have a thing and we want to save a copy of this thing. We want to see what changes were made, who made the changes, and if everything went to somewhere very warm in a handbasket, can we roll back from our change that did that to a previous one and see what's going on? Version control will also allow us to track and manage these. So, um, you know, version control is one of the ways that we can say like, okay, this is our documentation today. This is our documentation a year ago. These are the differences and we can diff the documentation. Um, we can also do things like say, okay, we've diffed the documentation. There's these three changes. These three changes were made by people, um, you know, Alice, uh, Susie, and 
Bob. And we can see that they made these changes, you know, on Friday afternoon after some kind of an update. And version control al allows us to see that. Version control can be done in-house, it can be outsourced, um, it could be done in the cloud. Some companies will have in-house version control and they'll do things like GitLab. Some people use version control like GitHub is a really popular one for people that write code. Um, you can actually see I have a GitHub out that keeps track of the code that I put out publicly. Um, but like all of that version control is how we can actually keep track of what happened and who made that happen. Documentation best practices. So this is what should be included in your documentation. So if you used any data language, um, data language descriptor scripts, uh, any procedures or functions, that should be written down and included in your documentation. Um, documentation should include any ER diagrams and schema that were created. Documentation should include your data dictionary and descriptions of your data, including clearly labeled keys. Documentation should include any business logic that is specific to your database and business, how you are doing version control, who has control of your version control, who is updating your documentation and how frequently are they doing it. And last but not least, what are the backup procedures and implementation guidelines for both the documentation and the database? It is important to write down how your database is being backed up when it is being backed up, how often it's being backed up, where it is being backed up, who has access to the backups, and are the backups as protected as the original database? Because we have to remember, if we are backing up our database and we have sensitive data, that backup of the sensitive data needs to be treated with the same kid gloves that the original sensitive data needed to be treated with. So that's really important. So these are all the things that should be included in good documentation. When you have this good documentation, you want to share it with other people. So some places will do interactive public websites. So companies will have their own intranet and they will actually have like, you know, uh, blog postings or interactive schema, things like that. Sometimes people will have documentation attached to a database. There's actually some companies that will, for I assume a relatively large fee, go in and actually create some documentation for the database, attach it to the database, and do all that. Sometimes it's a knowledge base somewhere within the company. They have an entire set of documentation in a repository somewhere. And that will be how it's being shared. You know you always go to this knowledge base. Um, now, importantly, I have some examples. These are not ads. I'm not saying buy this thing. I'm not saying this thing is amazing. Literally, these are just a couple of examples of very reasonable documentation out there that I've chosen to share. I picked them because they showed up early on the search. Lovely SEO. Um, you can see some samples of interactive website documentation. You can also see an example of a PDF that's reasonable documentation. You can find other examples online, obviously, of documentation. But this is just some of what to expect and kind of the things that you should look for when you're looking for documentation. So hopefully that was helpful for database documentation. And I hope you are all having a lovely week.